Welcome back to another interview. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Jonas Lang, who's the CEO of Cantor Resources, along with one of their largest shareholders and strategic advisors, Michael Gentili. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Justin. So thank you both for being here. And just before we get into today's results, uh, Michael, I've followed a lot of your previous interviews and I've noticed you have a criteria for following new investment opportunities. I'm wondering if you could tell us what that is and how Cantor Resources stacks up with those, uh, those criteria. Yeah, absolutely, Justin. So I come from an institutional money man management background where I was investing in producing mines for over you know 18 years and back in the institutional business again now. So when I got in the investment junior space, the junior microcap exploration space, maybe six years ago, I tried to reverse engineer, you know, what made the producing mines I was investing in for the past 20 years successful and what attributes did they have and tried to reverse engineer that into the juniors, even if they had five, $10 million market cap, kind of all those attributes of success and kind of come up with a checklist of things that I look for. It's not exhaustive. There's a lot more that goes into it, but, but from a high level, when I, when I, when you're investing in the junior space, the failure rate is very high. So the first thing I want to see is if I'm making, if I'm cutting a check, becoming a significant investor, I want to earn at least 10 to 50 times five zero my money on my investment, because I know a lot of investments are going to fail. But when I'm right, I've got to see enough return potential to pay for the losers. Because it's, mm. not, it's not a game where you're going to have a very high batting average, but the winner should make you a lot of money. So first thing I look at is, you know, market cap relative to the eventual market cap, if I'm right. So, you know, mm. Cantor Resources today has got a $14 million Canadian market cap. So you're starting off at a place where, if you do find a commercial deposit, you could definitely be in that 10 to 50 times your money window. Again, no guarantees. It's high, all are all high risk investments, but that's the, the starting point that I would look for. Uh, second thing would be the team itself. So what's the geology team look like? You know, what is the, what are the people, the technical people behind the team? Are they able to prosecute, find a good idea and effectively explore and exploit that opportunity? And equally important, the capital markets team, can, can they finance it properly? Do they, do know, do they know who to raise money from, who not to raise money from, when to raise money, how to raise money? Are they are the corporate governance places in, in place to give a good management and governance of the company? So for Cantor, again, they've got a great geological team. They've partnered with one of the top lithium exploration teams in Nevada that has a huge track record of success of identifying commercial deposits. And the capital markets team, I'm very familiar with almost all of them. And the board members have got a great record of knowing how to run junior mining companies, how to finance them, how to how to market them, and how to raise money, both institutionally and retail investors. So I was very comfortable with the team. That gave me a great confidence. Uh, thirdly, jurisdiction. You can have a great geology, great team, great capital markets, great market cap. But if you're in an area where you can't build a mine, either, either social resistance or government regulations, you're out of luck as well. In this case, we're in Nevada, which is consistently ranked the number one place to mine in the U.S. So you got to love that. And then I look for infrastructure. So if you've got roads, you know, power, educated workforce, uh, airports in place, that dramatically lowers your cost of exploration. And again, being in Nevada is, a, is an incredible advantage for Cantor at this stage of development. Uh, one of the last two things I look for would be, you know, scale and opportunity to be a mine. So even if I'm investing in like, you know, Cantor, which is drilling their first hole today, you know, putting out the press release today about the, the first well they've drilled in, in the project, we'd want to know, is there potential to be a mine if we're right? So some, some projects you can hit, or bodies, you can hit mineral mineralization, but you know from the get-go it doesn't have the scale, it doesn't have the footprint, it doesn't have the pedigree to be a mine. You know, even if you make it this commercial, so it's scale and commercial opportunity to be a mine. What I love about Cantor's project as well is it's a brine deposit. So brine deposits typically are much more profitable than, than hard rock deposits, and they're also a lot less expensive to prove out. So the last piece of the puzzle is they make an investment, we want to have a mine. How much is it going to cost me to find out yes or no? Is this a mine or not? Some projects can cost 20, 30, 40 million dollars to get to the answer because the expiration is expensive. It's a, it's a very long process to get an answer. In the case of Cantor, when I came in, in my discussions with Jonas and the team, for three to five million dollars, we're going to have a lot of certainty on whether this project has commercial potential. You're not going to have all the answers, but you're going to get a pretty good answer early on on whether this project has legs. And what's exciting about today's press release, uh, Justin, is the fact that we've got early indications that the thesis is correct. And we're just starting mm -hmm. to scratch the surface. These are very shallow holes that we drilled. But well, we're seeing the right type of thing. We're seeing the boron. We're seeing the lithium that you'd want to see in a commercial, positive, profitable discovery. And, and I'll pass it on to our resident expert here, Jonas, to, to walk you through the details on that. Thank you very much for that. And uh, just before we jump into that, into that, Jonas, because the results did look really interesting. And I noticed a quote from you, which uh, I want to get to it here in a moment. But uh, Michael, first, it sounds like you're kind of a private equity guy where you're 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 not expecting a thousand batting average and the ones that are going to go to zero are going to be made up for by the ones that are going to do the 10 to 50 x like you mentioned and uh what's really exciting about this is that like i said i've been following you for a while and i'm assuming that because you're on the call today that you're happy with the results too so 
After we hear from Jonas, I do want to circle back with you, but thank you very much for the context as it relates to your criteria, because it's something I often talk about with my investors too, is that if there's people who are more experienced than us, let's learn from them because uh, there's a reason why you've been successful over uh, over the last couple of decades. So thank you very much for that. Um, and Jonas, um, just before we jump in, um, on, our, on our last interview, we talked about what could go right and what could go wrong with these drill results. So could you please remind me what the original intention was by going out and doing these drills versus what you're actually able to uh, to talk about today in the news release? Yeah, for sure. The uh, This geoprobe drilling program is is really just testing the, the upper brine generation layer of the basin. This is a deep basin with several stacked targets and horizons to ultimately test. But in the central part of this property, our 3D model, uh, the MT data, showed a big geophysical anomaly indicative of brine's subsurface, uh, highly perspective for brine's. So this drill program, again, at a shallow level, we were looking to collect sediment and clay samples and capture water samples. Uh, in terms of what has gone right, you know, we were certainly looking to capture water samples, whether it was from pore spaces, groundwater, and test those for boron, lithium, potassium, et cetera. Uh, we were fortunate enough to encounter a shallow aquifer that stretched over two kilometers. So that was something we were targeting and hopeful to see, uh, but certainly a positive surprise uh, to the upside. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not a geologist. Um, I read the press release, but I'm wondering if you could make things a little bit more simple, like for a layman, like if you could talk to me like I'm five years old. So um, what exactly are the benefits of having both lithium and boron in this project versus what you thought you would get and what you're actually getting, if you don't mind? Sure. So, I mean, to a five-year-old, you could picture this uh, this big basin like a, a layered cake. Uh, ultimately, we're kind of testing the icing here at the top of the cake. Uh, looking for information to inform us in our modeling and, and kind of further prove out the concepts to continue pushing deeper into that cake. You know, the ultimate prize on the lithium side, if you picture this as a like a chocolate lava cake, you're ultimately looking for the, the centers or these sinks or these larger aquifers at deeper depths where lithium should mobilize down structure and concentrate and trap. Uh, in the upper levels of these types of systems, Boron is a great indicator. It's a great pathfinder. It's commonly used uh, to indicate there could be significantly larger lithium concentrations at greater depths. But again, as we've stated in the press release, the, the boron values, you know, believe are, are quite significant here on a standalone basis. And boron in this basin dates back to the late 1800s. There was borax production here, a uh, small little thriving town once upon a time. And the same volcanic rocks that feed Columbus are also feeding Ioneer's Rhyolite Ridge. That's a clay deposit, and that's a 300 million US market cap. So again, we have the right environment, the right structural uh, closed, hyd hydrologically closed basin here. And these results uh, generated good lithium and boron values uh, across two kilometers. Hmm. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, thank you for the context on that. I know it uh, might sound like a silly question, but I know some viewers are gonna appreciate it. So thank you for that. Um, one more question is, so like, I think people might be familiar with lithium, but I'm not sure. And like for myself as well, like I'm personally curious, um, what would be some of the applications for boron and, um, like, how do we see the company benefit benefiting from that? Yeah, it's, it's certainly lesser known. You know, when I look at lithium and, and boron, you know, one, I, I think we've seen the, you know, the price in lithium, uh, come off significantly. It looks like we're starting to move back in the right direction. So as a contrarian investor, looking at quality lithium projects, I think right now is timely, uh, the speculator side of me, certainly, you know, looking at boron, I'm, I'm very intrigued. Uh, it is lesser known, but it does have that feeling like other commodities we've seen that that migrate from the back pages towards the cover of a newspaper. It's been known, it's been around for a long time with industrial uses in ceramics and cleaning products and glass, uh, agriculture used to increase crop yields, etc. But the emerging applications in clean energy and tech are what excite me the most. Um, you know, we've, it's in semiconductors already, uh, MIT researchers have called the boron product, the best semiconductor material on earth. It's, uh, there's about as much boron in an electric vehicle as there is lithium. People mm. don't typically know that it's used in wind turbines, nuclear reactors, solar panels, and on and on and on. So there's a lot of emerging applications that are set to drive what is already a $2 billion market. Mm. Uh, significantly higher. It's expected to be added to the USGS critical list next year. 
Um, so again, there's a lot going for it. And the supply demand dynamics uh, are also intriguing. There are two companies globally that produce uh, about 80% of the world's boron supply. Um, that's Rio Tinto domestically in the US and mm -hmm. Etimaden, which is a Turkey state owned outfit uh, that, that produces about 45 to 50% of the world's supply. So again, it's rare to find significant concentrations of boron. We think we might have just that here at Columbus. It's known to be typically more shallow in a system. Lithium tends to, to follow it at deeper depths uh, commonly. Um, and so again, these results show really high boron values, both in the brines and in the sediments here from these first uh, first holes. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going to put myself in the viewer's shoes because I have a question that might be coming up for them where... A lot of times, like gold miners, they're going after the gold, but there happen to be other minerals in the mine. There might be silver, there might be copper. So I guess like what I'm asking here is, is the plan for Cantor to take both of these two production or is the goal to kind of trying to find like a partner who can actually better benefit from this? Yeah, still, I mean, still early days, right? We're, again, we're just testing that icing and ultimately we'll have to complete more drilling and assess the uh, the concentrations throughout this basin to, to come up with our end processing game plan. But um, the, the boron certainly is, is a valuable product. Uh, our belief is, you know, the thesis at this time would be perhaps you have a, a more boron rich interval within this basin and the upper levels, and you'd focus on that extraction and then a, a likely transition to the lithium at a, at a bit more of a moderate depth, uh, is the current feeling out here at, at Columbus. So it sounds like I'm a five-year-old and I just put my finger across the cake and I'm getting excited to eat it when it's, we haven't had supper yet. So cake comes after supper and we're still working on getting through that. So um, another question here would be uh, when we're thinking about the actual, uh, um, the drilling phase, it's going to continue into Q3. I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, what that means for the company and then whether or not there's funding in place to actually get there. Yeah, for sure. So we've we've completed an expanded 15 hole program. The results today are related to about five of those holes or 35% of the assays. So still plenty of assay results to come out from this first phase. But we're engaging uh, with Cascade, who did help us with this first phase of drilling uh, already with uh, a view towards starting again in earlier mid July, uh, certainly within Q3. Uh, to do some drilling that would go down twice as deep. So still shallow, but building mm -hmm. off of this success, we know there's a, an interpreted third zone that would be between about 100 and 150 feet subsurface uh, that we think we could see even higher boron grades uh, as well. So doing some infill drilling, these holes were spaced at 400 meters. So again, getting consistent values uh, with that kind of spacing, uh, you know, to Michael's Michael's point in terms of proving out uh, brine deposits, you don't need to drill these things off like a gold project at really tight centers. You can do broader space drilling, um, but looking at a phase uh, phase two that'll go a little deeper, test for that third zone and step out in some of the areas we were, we're having the most success. Mm. And fully and fully funded, sorry, that was the question. We've, we've got <laughs> the, cash in the cash in the bank to do that drilling as well uh, and get us through the year for sure. And that's part of what I found uh, very important is that uh, like you guys have been very efficient with your capital allocation to date and uh, a Brian project adds benefits, including like a cost of actually going out and actually proving the resource. So, uh, Michael, if you don't mind, I'm curious in in, in your own words, uh, maybe like what you kind of thought would happen at this project versus uh, what actually got materialized in this news release. Yeah, I mean, again, it comes back to the team, uh, Justin. I mean, I really like the thoughtfulness and the approach of the Cantor team. You know, originally... I think the initial thought was let's go spend two million bucks and drill two deep holes. You know, go right, go right for the center of that of that lava cake that uh, the Jonas spoke about. And then upon further reflection, I said, look, for a small amount of money, a modest fraction of that of money, we can prove this thing's got significant strike. We can prove, like today, fortunately, we found an aquifer fallow would greatly de-risk the deeper shots on gold. A lot of companies just go raise money, drill the hell mary drill shot right away don't do the strong geological work to de-risk those targets and end up blowing up the company. So I love what they've done here, which is for a small amount of money, you know, maybe your viewers aren't familiar with boron or lithium or brine deposits as Jonas is, but this is a significant de-risking of the project for a mm. small amount of money. And now we can step layer by layer down in the cake and get more and more certainty that the, the core of that lava cake that we're trying to hit is getting closer and closer. So for, to me, I'm extremely encouraged. I love when companies can, small, can spend small amounts of money, minimize dilution and drive tremendous value in the share price in the project and exactly what Canada's done today with this, this initial program. So congratulations to Jonas and the team on, on a great job so far. 
Yeah, congrats to both of you. So I'm just going to go through a couple of other things from previous interviews that I thought were compelling for the story. So I also know you guys have water rights. I think I know that's difficult to get in Nevada. And it looks like that's going to be able to uh, accelerate the project if we go to that next stage. I think that was an important one. And then uh, just the benefit of the brine project. So I think the fact like we talked about in previous interviews where this is just a lower cost of actually doing it. And uh, like you mentioned, like everything's been building up, like Mother Nature kind of gave us a really nice reserve here. So that worked out really well. And then touching on Michael's uh, criteria from before, I also really like the fact that the mother of lithium is involved here because um, she's had success before and uh, she clearly has a system that works and that you have that same geological team who's actually helped her bring other uh, resources to, uh, to, uh, to actual production. So I think those are some interesting things that uh, I remember from past interviews and uh, just wondering if there's anything else investors should be mindful of uh, as we look forward to the rest of 2024. Yeah, no, those are great points. I mean, a lot of these projects, as Michael said earlier, in terms of criteria, you know, asking if they make a discovery, can this actually become a mine? And mm -hmm. if you're targeting a brine project and you don't have water rights, that's a massive hurdle uh, in the Western United States, particularly. So that was an important uh, checkbox for us to cross off early. Um, you know, shows the confidence we had. There was a lot of work behind the scenes on securing those rights. Um, so that's a critical piece. Um, yeah, and this this project we believe is unique. You know, not just for lithium, for boron and other minerals. It's uh, it's again, it's a, it's a trap. It's this layer cake has acted like a sponge from these surrounding volcanics. Uh, again, we're testing this upper layer, so we're really excited for more results. Uh, we'll do more comprehensive analysis and, and share a, a really full summary of our interpretations once we have all the results back. Uh, and excited to keep testing deeper uh, in in the coming weeks. Hmm. So thank you both very much for your time today. And uh, for the audience, please just make sure to read the description for full disclosure details. Otherwise, thank you again for your time. And I look forward to our next interview here, uh, Jonas. Thank you again. Thank you.